oh goodness, lots of symbols. X is less than or equal to negative one. I'm getting there. Okay. So which of the following describes all values of x uh, for which one minus x squared is greater than or equal to zero? Okay, so one of the things, one of the first uh, big insights on this one is something you absolutely should have committed to memory on the GMAT to save yourself some time. Um, and that's the difference of two squares. Whenever you get something that is x squared minus y squared, that factors out to x plus y times x minus y. It doesn't matter what the two squares are. They can both be variables. They can both be numbers. I guess if they're both numbers, you could solve it just with numberness, arithmetic. But um, when you have partial variables and partial numbers, it still works. Difference of two squares, um, we can simplify here. So 1 minus x. 1 minus x squared, 1 is a perfect square, or 1 is the square of 1, you know, and x squared is also. So uh, this is the same thing as x plus y, whoa, what the heck am I doing? 1 plus x times 1 minus x is greater than or equal to 0. So here it gets complicated because we, uh, instead of just having an equation, we have a range of values that we have to solve for. First thing is easy. Um, if um, x is equal to either 1 or negative 1, so x could equal 1 or negative 1, and this would equal 0. So if x is, you know, um, if it's 1 here, or if it's negative 1 here, these two balance out, um, and it equals 0. So um, that represents one kind of one kind of area to define our solution space. So we know that um, the range of values does need to include both one and negative one. Okay, so we can cross off um, this one includes one, but it doesn't include um, negative one, so that can't be right. Um, this one includes negative one, but not one. Uh, this one includes one, but not negative one. So here we have we are basically left with two answer choices. Just deciding that um, we have x is less than or equal to negative one, or x is greater than or equal to one, or x is between the two numbers. So we have basically two options. Imagine it's a number line: zero, one, negative one. One answer choice is saying this. It's actually answer choice E. And then another answer choice is saying this. And that's D. So which is it? It's actually just look. Um, what happens if x is greater than 1? Or less than negative 1. But let's just try greater than 1. If x is greater than 1, um, this ends up being a positive number. Let's, uh, x is greater than 1. Uh, the first number ends up being a positive number. The second number ends up being a negative number because we're subtracting something larger than 1 from 1. Um, and, uh, of course, positive times a negative equals a negative, and we have uh, greater than or equal to 0 here. So uh, this whole expression is supposed to be a non-negative number. Therefore, we can't have something where x is greater than 1. On that basis alone, we can actually cross off answer choice D, but let's just be thorough because um, I want to explain how this is actually working. What, what happens if x is less than negative 1? Like it's, uh, you know, negative 3. So if x is negative 3, 1 plus negative 3 in the first expression um, ends up being a negative number. 1 minus negative 3 in the second expression, this ends up being a positive number. If we had been able to get a negative times a negative, we could still ended up still have ended up with a non-negative number as the final on the other side of the inequality. But there's literally no way we can choose a value for x 
uh, along the lines of choice D uh, from, you know, beyond, further from zero than one and negative one, or further from higher absolute value um, than one, because it ends up with one negative and one positive number. So choice D cannot be right. Logically then, um, let's just talk about it. What this means is for choice E, X is a fraction, well, it could be one, but if it's a fraction less than one, let's just say that X is, uh, you know, X is less than one, but greater than negative, greater than zero. If X is a fraction, like one half, one plus one half in the first term, that ends up being a positive number, one minus one half, even though it makes this second, um, second expression smaller, it stays positive. Positive times positive still gives us greater than or equal to zero. Um, well, it wouldn't be equal to zero, it'd be greater than zero. But we already established that x could be one or negative one itself. So answer choice E must be our correct answer. And with that, we move on to page 177. Question number 174. So one eighth, one half, three fourths, seven eighths, and fifteen sixteenths. Okay. So the probability is one half that a certain coin will turn up heads on any given toss. If the coin is to be tossed three times, what is the probability that on at least one of the tosses, the coin will turn up tails? Um, reminder of our definition of probability here, it's the number of desired outcomes over the total number of outcomes. And remember that all probability fractions are expressed as a fraction between 0 and 1 inclusive. Something can have a probability fraction of 0 if it has no chance of happening. Uh, it can also have, have a probability of 1 if it is definitely going to happen. What this means is that the probability of what you want to happen or what you're trying to figure out and the probability of what you don't want to happen or what you're not really trying to figure out, those two fractions add up to 1 total every time. So. Um, another way to think about probability is uh, the number 1 minus, um, what should I call this, uh, unwanted, the unwanted probability equals the wanted. And the reason you would do this is sometimes it's actually just e easier, easier to figure out the thing that you don't want to figure out or it's easier to figure out the thing that you don't want to arrive at the answer for. So uh, and so one of the things you always want to do when you have probability questions with coin flips or anything like that is figure out what the total number of outcomes could be. So um, if you have one coin flip that's one out of two, you have a second coin flip that's one out of two, you have the third coin flip that's one out of two, it's one half times one half times one half. Any given coin flip uh, has a one, you know, any given series of three coin flips has a one in eight chance of happening, whether it's, you know, three heads, three tails, two heads, one tail, any of those things. Um, for small enough questions, you can actually just write out all the probabilities. And in something like this where there's only eight different ways it can work out, it may just be faster for you or easier for you to write out all the possibilities. We'll do it both ways. Um, so, um, we're trying to figure out the probability that um, at least one of the tosses comes up tails. So we have, you know, three coins, you know, so it's either going to be heads or tails. In this particular case, it's actually easier to figure out how many ways um, it could not come up at least one tails. So um, there's really only one way you can have no tails at all, and that's that if you get heads, heads, heads on all three coin flips. So uh, one minus the probability of the thing that we don't want to happen, the unwanted probability, that one in eight chance of heads, 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 one minus one eighth equals seven eighths, answer choice D.
We also could have written all, out all of our choices here. Again, there's only eight, so we have um, tails, 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 and then we do ones with one heads coming up once. Order does matter. Heads, tails, tails is different from tails, heads, tails, and that in turn is different from tails, tails, heads. Now we do our ones with uh, heads appearing twice. We have heads, heads, tails. We have heads, tails, heads, and uh, tails, heads, heads, leaving us only with the three heads in a row. And we're, we're looking for how many ways can it come up with tails at least once. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So either way, uh, I mean, especially if probability is not your strong suit, um, I do advise you to study it enough so that a problem like this appears manageable. Um, you know, uh, really, really hard probability questions are pretty rare, and you have to be doing pretty well on the quantitative section to get them. Um, lower level probability questions are more common, and it's in your best interest to be able to handle this type of question pretty quickly. However, um, if you can't, or if this is what you're going to, you know, you're making a strategic decision to limit your um, studies of probability, um, do be comfortable writing out all the, all the choices if you need to, because getting the question right is the most important thing. OK. Uh, 175 on 177. Uh, and we have 80, 110, 160, 200, and 400. So of the final grades received by the students in a <clears throat> excuse me, received by the students in a certain math course, one-fifth are A's, one quarter are B's, one half are C's, and the remaining 10 grades are D's. What is the number of students in the course? And so if going, going from ratios to actual numbers um, is tricky business. Um, so we know, though, that uh, one-fifth of the course are A's. And if we add that to um, one-fourth of the class are B's, and we add the one half of the class that are C's. That gives us what fraction of the, and then we know that the entire rest of the class got D's. So nobody failed. Good news for this certain math course. Let's add this fraction together to find out, you know, whatever, what fraction this will be. Um, the common denominator of 5, 4, and 2 is 20. So we want to turn this whole thing into 20ths. So we multiply the whole thing times, uh, well, we have to multiply this guy. Oh my goodness. I really do know some math. Okay. To get 20th, we need to multiply this guy times 4, this guy times 5, and this guy times 10. So uh, the A's are 4 20ths. Um, the uh, B's are 5 20ths. And the C's are 10 20ths. Add that all together, 5 plus 4 plus 10, 19 twentieths of the students are, got A's, B's, or C's, and um, which means then um, that 1 twentieth of the class got D's, and we know that that equals 10 students. We got the actual number for the number of D's. Let's make this explicit, A, B, C. So 19 out of 20 got A, B, C, 1 out of 20 got D, and we know that that, that actual number is 10. So if 1 20th of the class is 10 students, then there are 200, 200 students in the class. I'm trying to think if I need to explain that another way to make it make sense. Um, I think that's pretty clear that, you know, that uh, we figured out how many of A's, B's, and C's. 1 one 20th is the only remaining fraction of those who did not get a, B, A's, B's, or C's, and we got the actual number of that, so we would just multiply times 20 to figure out the actual number.